young man in Okinawa, Gichin Funakoshi studied karate with masters Azato and Itosu. When in 1922 he moved to Tokyo and became one of the first karate pioneers in Japan, it was their style that he taught. A system he described in his book Karate do Kyohan as Shorin, contrasting it with the Nahate, the forerunner of Goju Ryu, which he referred to as Shorei. In a meeting room at the Meisei Juku, a hostel for expatriate Okinawans, he held classes that were attended by a small number of devotees. At these he taught the basic cutters of Shorin Yu and little else. They were, according to Takashi Otsuka, the five Pinan Kata, three Naihanshi, Jitte, Jion, Chinto, Seishan, Wanshu and Passai. The pace of the lessons was leisurely, and often part was given over to lectures by Funakoshi Sensei at that time in his mid-fifties. In the hands of his most senior students, his teachings would develop into the modern karate styles we know today. Each, according to the preferences of its founder, took a slightly different path. Shotokan and Shotokai evolved mainly in the universities and were designed to accommodate the needs of students. Wadolyu was influenced by the jujitsu background of its founder, Takashi Otsuka. The Shindo Jinnen Ryu Karate of former Kendo and Jiu-Jitsu master Yasuhiro Konishi took its inspiration from both Funakoshi and his nemesis, the celebrated karate master Choki Motobu. Funakoshi's Okinawan karate movement grew faster in mainland Japan than he had dared hope. However, by the mid-30s, it had become so uniquely Japanese that its proponents felt it needed little if any sustenance from its native soil. Japanese martial principles replaced those that the Okinawans had developed from early Chinese models, profoundly affecting training methods, techniques and combat strategy. Funakoshi had been taught karate alone, in complete secrecy, and then only after satisfactory character references had been provided to his instructors. Now the classes were public, open to all, and military in structure. The Okinawan masters regarded competition as unnecessary and dangerous. In the Japanese universities, it was encouraged. The supporting elements of makiwara and supplementary training so important to the Okinawans were largely dispensed with by Japanese exponents. When Japanese karate rose from the ashes of post-war Japan, it was very different from the art Gichin Funakoshi had introduced just 20 years before. Modern, progressive and competitive in outlook, it was well suited to the times into which it was born. Its values reflected those of its adopted nation and it derived prestige and social acceptance from its close association with a number of famous universities. In Okinawa, by contrast, tradition was revered and karate remained largely unchanged. Training was brutally realistic. Students were coached individually. Body conditioning and makiwara training were obligatory. Karate was still very much a martial art and remained, as a result, intact but obscure. Modern karate evolved in Japan and became closely identified with that country as it spread rapidly around the world. Yet it is in the orthodox form that the most valuable secrets of karate are to be found. Inexplicable power, superhuman strength and extraordinary stamina. These are the hallmarks of real karate. The art referred to by Okinawan masters past and present as Uchinadi. The art that remains, in its purest form, a treasure of the unique culture of the Okinawan archipelago.
this series deals with the history of karate, striking methods using internal energy, blocking techniques and the transfer of power as well as the five original Pinnan Kata and Daihanshi. exercises of karate contain the individual techniques of a style and the combinations in which they can be successfully performed. After years of training, the advanced student realizes that they contain also the elements of strategy that have been involved by generations of masters, each adding his discoveries to the achievements of those who preceded him. The first real break with the tradition of accumulated wisdom occurred in the early part of the 20th century. Around 1906, in order to introduce karate into the Okinawan school system, the Pinnan Kata were developed. These were contrived in the sense that they evolved not from successful encounters with other karate fighters, but as a result of the desire to make the art popular amongst the young people of Okinawa. It was not the intention that the traditional kata be changed in any way. The Pinnan kata was simply to provide entry-level training for the novice. Kata is still the most basic and important element of karate training. It is a tried and true method of teaching the body to perform movements efficiently. It is the doorway to action without thought, response without reflection, defense without fear.
While the Okinawans admit they borrowed from a number of sources in developing their indigenous self-defense method, the use of the makiwara appears to be unique to their islands. From the photographs that have come down to us, it is clear that the pioneers of karate felt its use was vital and its practice never to be neglected. Gichin and Yoshitaka Funakoshi are often pictured at the makiwara. Chalky Motobu practiced daily. Kenwa Mabuni, the founder of Shitoryu, struck the makiwara for an hour every morning. As karate developed in Japan, it changed radically. The increasing emphasis on competition led to the almost complete abandonment of makiwara training. Speed to score points in competition became the priority. The goal of the old masters of delivering a single debilitating blow to the target was forgotten in the race to make karate an international sport. The result was a new form of karate that, while not lacking in speed or vitality, produced students who did not study energy projection and target penetration. Deprived of the benefits of makiwara training, their power tended to remain locked within their bodies, resulting in stiff and rather mechanical movements when compared to the fluid, wave-like motion of Okinawan experts. The makiwara, literally rolled straw in Japanese, has changed little over the years. There is evidence to suggest that straw was originally used to cushion blows, not simply because it was plentiful and inexpensive. According to folklore, rice straw had the power to ward off evil spirits, and for that reason was used to bandage wounds and assist in a spiritual way with their healing. Makiwara training is very important for all karateka. The height of the makiwara should be approximately that of your shoulder. As far as the basic stance is concerned, when practicing with the right hand, the right foot points towards the makiwara, as does the left toe, to form a triangle. When you do your basic training, it should feel as if you are stretching your arm. When you form your fist, you use these two knuckles principally. The first knuckle transmits between 60 and 70 percent of the power, and the second, the rest. To develop the power of the hips, stand in the same stance and with the arm extended, thrust like so on both sides.
in actual use, to generate as much striking power as possible, lower your body using your knees at the moment of impact. Another important point is not to hit the makiwara thoughtlessly like this. Strike slowly and with concentration. Do not lean on the makiwara when you strike, but hold your body upright with your chest open. Elbow strikes are powerful techniques that depend on a whipping action for maximum effect that in the case of a punch is delivered with the wrist. This is why, when training, we strike the makiwara a glancing blow like this and drop the body using the knees to develop as much striking power as possible. All types of techniques and combinations of techniques should be practiced on both sides in makiwara training to ensure realism. After all, in a real fight, you have to hit your opponent when he presents you with a target no matter what position you find yourself in. All techniques benefit from makiwara training. Close-up techniques like this use the hips to develop power rather than the arms. Extra punching power can be gained by raising the body slightly using the ankles and knees at the moment of impact. Change position and your distance to the target periodically. These days, the need to prevent the spread of blood-borne diseases dictates that students use a personal makiwara pad or a pair of suitable gloves when training. Soft leather gloves also provide protection to fists numb from constant pounding being damaged as a result of their insensitivity to pain. Serious makiwara training does not have to result in callous knuckles.
Expand the scope of your training by adding movement as this will help you with distance and timing. Learn how to deliver power when standing on one leg and unbalanced. And when attacking an opponent to the side. There is little to be gained from standing motionless before a makiwara and simply pounding it. Maximum benefits result from the intelligent use of this important piece of equipment to improve overall fighting performance, not simply static punching power. According to Gichin Funakoshi's instructor, the legendary karate master Itosu Anko, qualified and responsible instructors since ancient times have taught both karate and weapon arts, suifa, bo, nunchaku and sai, because they are like brother and sister. Photographic records do indeed confirm that the use of weapons was once common amongst karate practitioners, the most popular being the bo and the sai. We can, without difficulty, document their widespread use in Japan until just after World War II, when interest seems to have declined as modern, university-based karate developed. While armed and unarmed systems are closely related, they are certainly not the same. The considerations of distance and timing are completely different. In other words, performing karate techniques with a weapon in one's hand is not Kobudo. There are two main types of side techniques, suki, thrusts, and then furi, swinging strikes. At an advanced level of training, you do the techniques like this, without moving too much. But for practice, the movements can be made much larger, like this. What is very important is that you don't allow your side to flop around like this. Keep them close to your arms. Movement must be continuous. Do not allow the side to pause. They must be constantly in motion. In this case, you can either strike to the upper level like so, or follow through with a cutting motion. It's also very important to keep your weapons hidden from your opponent, behind your arms or body. When you strike at your target, use your fingers and hand to aim and direct your attack.
And last but not least, you mustn't open your guard like this. Protect your center line at all times.
this series we have looked to the past, not for reasons of nostalgia, nor because we wish to denigrate what is of this age, simply because it is new. We look back to the founders because karate as a martial art was born in the past, and that is, therefore, where its secrets lie. They come from a time when they had great practical value. They are preserved for that purpose today, but also for the related benefits they offer, health, confidence, and that elusive, indefinable, but much admired quality, character. Long forgotten by many, ignored by others, and misunderstood by all but a few, the secrets of karate will always be mysteries to those who will not listen, enigmas to those who refuse to see, conundrums to those who will not open their hearts to the truth. Thank you.